searing images of Afghans desperate to escape in the final days of the U.S. withdrawal, people clinging to the wheels of a C-17 on the runway at Kabul airport. Then the suicide bombing at the Abbey Gate, killing 13 U.S. troops, 11 Marines, a soldier and a sailor. Also dead, 170 Afghan civilians. Thousands of Afghans got out, but thousands more, eligible for visas because they had worked for the U.S., along with their families, were left behind. How did you feel when that last plane left and you hadn't gotten on, you and your family on it? Heartbroken. We are hiding his face because a man the U.S. troops called Frank still has relatives back home, where he worked as a military and State Department translator for 12 years, was eligible for a special visa and had a State Department badge. When I got to the airport, I showed my passport, I showed my badge. They didn't accept. They said no. I was so close to, to burn the badge and, and just go to the Taliban and tell them that I was doing this, and if you want to kill me, kill me now. Frank's former commander says he did a critical a job. Man. He was impeccable. Um, we relied on him. I uh, had the biggest heart in the world and did everything we, we asked for him. They're an intelligence officer. They're an operations officer. They're a, uh, they're a chief operating officer. Uh, they do it all. And the bottom line is you could not accomplish your mission, whether it was military, governmental, or commercial without him, period. Frank spent 10 months hiding from the Taliban, moving his family from house to house every three days, was one of thousands pleading for help from nonprofit aid groups like No One Left Behind, led by Afghanistan war veteran Philip Caruso. People who are telling us, telling me that their children are starving to death, uh, that they're on the run, that their family members have been killed or arrested or tortured. Um, one person told me uh, that he was going to sell his kidney so he could try to feed his family for a little while longer while he waited for his visa application to be approved and to be evacuated. Frank says after one last close call with the Taliban, he knew he had to leave his country immediately. They stopped my car and said, do you know, for example, Frank? I told him, yes, I know him. And I had no options. I said, where, where would be he? I told him, this is his house. And sometimes he's going to the gym and sometimes he's going to the cafe. Then he said, okay, thank you so much and get lost. Then I just, tomorrow I got the flight tickets and I went to back to Capitol. And I, I was talking with my family and told them that let's go to the Pakistan. I was not safe in Pakistan as well. And I was thinking even, even when I watched my shadow, I thought that someone is following me. Finally, I got the visa, SIV visa. That was very hard. Uh, I wait f too long for that. How did the U.S. government fail these people, these Afghan translators who worked with the U.S. military and were so critical in so many ways, saving lives? It's a series of failures. It starts with the original legislation itself that created the program. Uh, it was beset by unclear language, ambiguity, uh, deadlines for applications that were repeatedly extended on an annual basis. There were some years it wasn't extended at all. And that created this temporary sense uh, of the program that pervaded throughout all of the different agencies that have a role to play within it. And so they were never properly staffed or resourced. For those left behind needing a personal interview to complete their visa applications, there was no longer a U.S. Embassy in Kabul. It was Catch-22. One of the mistakes that I made was put all my family and the risk. So if I knew it, I wouldn't struck. You wouldn't have done this again because you put your children at risk. Doing that again would be easy for me because now I feel my family is safe here. But if I anticipated and that 12 years ago, I would never stop. These translators receive no benefits despite years of service, something Colorado Congressman Jason Crow an Iraq and Afghanistan war veteran is trying to fix. And in Afghanistan, there's so many dialects, so many different languages, that really understanding the signals and the private communications is so critical. They're intelligence resources, right? That's absolutely right. This isn't just uh, translating words. It's understanding the culture. It's understanding what's happening. It's, it's understanding the, the history behind uh, a tribe uh, or a, a, um, a neighborhood or, or a small village. Uh, those are the intangibles that are so valuable when we're trying to accomplish our mission and we're trying to protect our soldiers. 
you know, to get my soldiers home alive. I needed that service. I needed that support of those local Afghans. His bipartisan Afghan Adjustment Act would help these Afghans get permanent residency in the U.S., clearing a path to benefits, jobs, and eventually citizenship. We have an obligation to these folks, and I'm never going to stop fighting for them. Almost a year after the U.S. withdrawal, Frank and his family finally arrived in the U.S. in July, without jobs or benefits, but asked if they could pose in front of the American flag. And then I shout on for my kids, guys, we made it. And now it's time, if you want to cry, if you want to shout, it's time to do that. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.